Good morning, Calvary Chapel young people. I hope everybody is doing well. This week we're going to continue to look into Paul's missionary journeys. In Acts 19, Paul has gone to Asia. And if you remember last week, we studied and Paul wanted to go to Asia, but God said no, the timing wasn't right. And they sent him to Macedonia, where he spent a number of months spreading the good news about Jesus Christ. But now Paul is in Asia, and he is going to be sharing the good news of Jesus with the people in this area. We're going to learn three important lessons as we go through our Sunday School lesson today. The first is the importance of the Holy Spirit. That's number one. Number two is the importance of courage in the ministry. We'll learn about that. And it may surprise you what we learn about having courage in the ministry. And thirdly, and most importantly, is to always trust in God. But before we do that, Julia, will you lead us in our opening prayer? I certainly will. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for having the opportunity to study the Bible and to share it with the kids of Calvary Chapel, Half Moon Bay. We thank you for our church. We thank you for the people inside the church. We lift them up in prayer, Lord, and we thank you while we have this opportunity to learn a little bit more about you and the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus. So be with us during our lesson, Lord. Help us teach well. Help us learn well. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's start in Acts 19, verse 1 through 4. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism, referring to John the Baptist. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance and saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him that is on Christ Jesus. So as he traveled, Paul, Paul met disciples. Had, had, they, had they been baptized in the Holy Spirit? No, they were baptized in a baptism of repentance. They had not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior yet because they had not been led that way. John the Baptist was the forerunner to Jesus, we know, and he was declaring the people they should repent of their sins in preparation of Jesus Christ's coming. So theirs was a baptism of repentance rather than of salvation? Right. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we're going to keep reading, verse 5 to 10. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid eyes on them, when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all, and he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some of them were hardened and, and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them, and he withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus 
both Jews and Greeks. How long did Paul teach in the synagogues? Uh, he's taught in the synagogue for three months. And why did, why did he spend so much time in the synagogue? Well, he, that's, where the, that's where the believers in God, the Jews, would, would be. And so that's where he went. He went to the synagogue to teach them about Jesus. And he, he spent three months. But as, as the scripture said, their hearts hardened and they would not believe. So, when should we tell someone that they were doing something that is wrong and might be bad for them? That's got to be difficult. Well, it is difficult. And I think Paul was faced with the choice of whether to tell people they were doing wrong in the synagogue after he had spent three, three months there. And lots of people just don't want to hear it. Uh, lots of people believe what they believe and, and they're, they don't have ears or hearts open to hearing something new. So Paul went in every day to tell them because he wanted, to, he wanted them to be saved. And making the decision of telling people repeatedly that they need to re-examine what they're doing, maybe do things a different way, that's, that's a hard decision to make. People don't want to argue. Paul didn't want to argue. Um, and, it, and it can be a hard choice whether or not you continue to have that conversation. And you certainly, when you're, when you're witnessing for the Lord, you certainly can't make that choice at all without praying about it. And, and we feel certain that Paul prayed about it. And then when, when their hearts were not softening to the message, after three months, he moved on. So it's an important lesson for us to learn. Our obligation is to share the Word of God with individuals but God and the Holy Spirit will deal with the individual and will lead that individual or at least give that individual the opportunity to accept him as their personal savior so we we can't make somebody believe no nope. all nope. we can do is share our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done in our lives. That's all we can do. Okay. Now, in Acts 19, 11, and 12, we read, Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hand of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the disease left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Well, what what were they, what were they doing with his handkerchiefs? What what were they, were they trying to cure people's sicknesses and heal them with the handkerchief? Well, the handkerchief really is just a symbolic gesture. What was really healing them was the Holy Spirit working through uh, the individuals who had accepted Christ as their Savior. And they were following the lead of the Holy Spirit in their lives as he led them to individuals. And then certain people, when they become Christians and they ex receive what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they're given certain abilities. Some people, uh, especially in the old, uh, older periods of time, had the ability to uh, lay hands and cure people. Some people have, as, as we studied in uh, a few months ago about the gifts of the Spirit, there are many gifts, and they're given to different peoples for different reasons. Uh, so some people were given the ability to heal, but that was the Holy Spirit working through them, not the cloth, not the apron, or not that individual. It was just the individual allowing the Holy Spirit to work through him. Okay, okay. So reading on, also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? 
And then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped upon them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Uh, do you think that the seven sons that are referred to here had the power of the Holy Spirit? No, no, they hadn't yet accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and, and so they, they couldn't ex command demons to come out of a person. Um, they, they just didn't have that power. They didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit. So without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life, you, you can't do these things. That's, that's exactly right. And, you know, the, the importance of the Holy Spirit in our faith is, is, is a lot. It's very important. Faith, the Holy, the, our faith is in God. And our belief is that God is made up of three. It's made up of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And without having that Holy Spirit in us, our, it, our, it's incomplete. The faith is incomplete. The Holy Spirit is part of God, and he's that part of God that walks with us. So That's what important. we refer to as the Godhead. That's right. That's right. Okay, continuing on, uh, Acts 18 through 20. And many who had believed came, confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic through the books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Well, what does that mean? They came confessing and telling their deeds. Well, confessing we know means to confess our sins. But telling is what today we refer to as your personal testimony. And they were t testifying to what the Lord Jesus has done in their life since they accepted him as their personal savior. Much as we do today, we have people who will give their testimony uh, to members of the church body or to just share it with individuals they come in touch with. So, it's just kind of like telling your story, huh? Kind of. An, yeah. an important your faith story. Yeah, pretty important one. Though. Yeah, your faith story. Well, what, what what about the book burning? What, what was that about after hearing the story of salvation? Well, the people in Ephesus who practiced magic uh, realized that they were practicing evil things. Magic in those days, in the way it was used, is considered evil. And when they turned their life over to God, they wanted to rid themselves of any of their evil past. So symbolically, by burning the books and the scrolls, they were saying, we're turning away from what we did in the past and we're going to trust. And here's where we learn about trusting in God and what he has for us in our future life. So they came to trust in God rather than in the tricks that they could do or the money they could earn by doing those tricks? Yeah, because I think we always have to remember when we use the term magic, mm -hmm. it's really tricks and it's how you do the trick that uh, fools people just makes them believe something that's not true. It makes them think that the magician is more powerful, really, than they are. Because we go to magic shows now, and that's entertainment, but those magicians aren't pretending to be godlike. No, they're pretending. They're Most of them, they say they're illusionists, not, ah, that's not right. magicians anymore. And, and they don't pretend to be something they're not. That's true. They, that's they're that's entertainers, and that's what they do, and you can go and have fun with it, uh, but remember, it's only entertainment. Good point. So reading on, verses 23 to 30, And about that time 
there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with workers of similar, similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they, they are not gods, which were made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of failing into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana might be despised and all of her magnificence destroyed whom all Asia and the world worship. And when they heard this, they were full of wrath, and they cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, and Paul's traveling companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. So what kind of sculptures were they making? Well, they were making statues of the goddess Diana. They considered her to be a god. And they made, they, they made, they probably made small statues and big statues, but they made statues that people could buy. And actually all they were were a piece of metal. They, we might have thought of it. May have been wood too, but. And, and they may have been very beautiful and they may have taken great skill to make. But they were not gods. No, they were just objects. And they were being sold to be worshipped. Why were Demetrius and his friends so angry with Paul? Well, because Paul was leading the people to Jesus. In order to be led to Jesus, they would have to reject this idea that these statues were gods. And so... Um, if these were no longer gods, they weren't worthy of worship and they weren't as worth as much money. Probably weren't worth anything. No. And, Except and maybe as an art piece. Maybe as an art piece, but, you know, a lot of people had a copy of that art piece. So they, their, their monetary value, what they could, how much money could they get if they sold them, that, that was much less. And so they were going to lose money. So it was if, really great. It was greed. And as the scripture said, that's how they made their profit, their money. And uh, that, that was that they were they were angry with him because he was getting in the way of them earning that kind of money. And then we hear, you know, we have this angry mob is seizing Paul's companions. Why would they go after Paul's companions? Well, you know the they, they think that Paul took something special from them in the way of money or earning power. And I think they were, they were mad. They were acting out. They were rioting. And they, they didn't like what Paul and his friends were doing. So they, they grabbed him. You think they were going to harm him? I think they might have. I know. Yeah. I think they might have. Mob rule is not a good thing. No, it's not. But we learn more about that in a couple minutes. Uh, do you think Paul wanted, he wasn't there, but do you think he wanted to go there and help him? Oh, absolutely. His Remember, Paul's a warrior. Remember how in his previous life when he was known as Saul, he would, he would chase down Jews and, and Christians, excuse me, he would chase down Christians who had converted from Judaism and, and he would hurt them and he would kill them. He was, and he was, so he was a tough guy. And, and I think, yeah, I think he, he, he very much wanted to go and help. But he didn't because the city officials and the members of the way persuaded him not to. And I, I think maybe they did that because they recognized that as tough as Paul could be, he was tough for Jesus too. And they wanted him and his, his, his hard working and his toughness in a way, and and not not he didn't want him to get get involved with this this riot. And I think probably 
the Holy Spirit was leading them not to go. I think so. I think so. It probably would have been. It probably might have been very dangerous. All right. Uh, continue reading, and uh, we're going to read thirty-four through thirty-eight. It says, "But when they found out that he was a Jew, all." with one voice cried out for about two hours, a lot of screaming, Great is Diane of the Ephesians. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that know the city of Ephesus is the temple guardian of the great goddess Diane? and of the image which fell from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who have neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open, and there are pro councils. Let them bring charges against one another. So, again, explain what, what the city officials were telling Demetrius to do. He told them there was an orderly way to file a complaint against people. That rioting in the street was not the way to go. And attacking people or attacking people's property is not the proper thing to do. And remember, this man was probably not a Christian, and he recognized that mm. rioting was wrong. So they, they had a way, they had courts, and they had judges. And so what he was telling Demetrius and his, his friends to do was take him to court. Yeah. Show him. Take him to court. Take him to court. Yeah, okay. Okay. And the Lord, or the Holy Spirit in this case, would probably have changed the judge's mind. Oh, that's I'm good. sure Paul would have won in a court. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is, you know, we have, we have city officials saying destroying other people's property and fighting with other people and hurting other people, throwing rocks at them. This kind of sounds like a good lesson for today, too, doesn't it? I think so. I it think, does. I think a lot of people should read this and think about what's going on in our country today. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how important it is, how blessed we are to have Jesus' Jesus' salvation and to have accepted that in our hearts. And we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts so that when we get in those situations, this is a lesson we've already been taught and, and hopefully will protect us and protect others as in those situations where we decide that we, we want to express ourselves, which we should do. And remember, when we talked about the fruits of the Spirit, Paul said the greatest was love. Well, we've learned many things today, Mr. Rudy. They, these are lessons that were taught thousands of years ago, and they're lessons that are every bit as important for us today. Absolutely. And we've learned about the importance of the Holy Spirit, that the Godhead, as you, as you named it, the God, the, the, the Trinity, the, the God, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit make up what we believe in as God. And having the Holy Spirit in our hearts every day, every moment, is super important. The second thing we learned today was that sometimes in ministry, it takes courage. And some, in some ministries, it takes more courage than others. It doesn't really take a lot of courage in children's ministry, <laughs> because we've got great kids. But it takes courage to go to a country where they don't speak the language that you know. And it takes courage to go into places where they maybe don't treat people as well as we treat people in our families and in our community. And the, it, it takes courage because 
you know, it's hard to go in among strangers and start telling them that the stuff they're doing, they need to reconsider. So courage, and, and the, we can trust the Holy Spirit to give us courage when we're following God's will in our, in our decisions about ministry. And then like, this leads us to our third point. When we trust in God, when we make our plans in prayer and by listening to the leadings of the Holy Spirit, trusting in God, that's, that's where we're going to be the most successful. And so... In God, all things are possible. And, and in God, all things are, are, are possible. So we learned again. We learned a lot. Uh, we, can, we can think about these things today, tomorrow, and every day. These are things that are very relevant and, and make a lot of sense as we live our daily lives. Well, we hope you all had a great July 4th, even though it's probably a different kind of July 4th yep. than you've experienced in years past. But we're looking forward to seeing you next week. We miss you. Same time, same channel. So let's have a closing prayer, and uh, we just wish you the best. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the opportunity that we have to share your word with our young people. And we just lift them up to you. We ask that you bind everything bad from them, that you protect their brothers and their sisters and their moms and dads, and that you just walk with them and guide them and direct them in all that they do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bye-bye. <laughs>